We are here at the Eisenhower Library and Museum, and I want to say hello and welcome on Kenneth Johnson. Kenneth, why don't we have you take a seat, sir, and um, hear about you and your story as we celebrate the 80th anniversary of uh, D-Day. So, Kenneth, good morning. What's, um, what's your backstory, and, and take us through your history here. And Okay, well, I at the time, and I, I was uh, drafted into the Army in World War II when I was 18, and uh, I trained as a uh, in field artillery, but I was sent to Panama, and I was assigned to uh, Fourth Coast Artillery. And we were planning, uh, servicing, and planning harbor control harbor mines uh, to protect the Panama Canal. And uh, we had the canal sewed up with hydroplanes out ahead of the minefield, and. Uh, we could control the mines from an underground control station called a casemate. Uh, but while I was there, Eisenhower invested. He flew in, and I think it's a Sunflower II uh, twin engine plane. And we, part, I was part of an honor guard with the Army, the Navy, and the Marines uh, who uh, met Eisenhower when he flew into uh, Albrook Field. Uh, then the next day, he inspected us in ranks over Fort Amador, and uh, so we stood in ranks with our M1 rifles. So you met President, I- or at the time, obviously, General Eisenhower. Yes. I- I- as you were protecting the Panama Canal. That's correct. And what year would this have been? That would have been in the summer of 46. Summer of 46. Right after the war. Right after the war. Yeah. Okay, so um, how old are you? I'm uh, 97. 97. Yes. When do you turn 98? Uh, not until next April. Oh, okay. So you just turned 97. Yes. So a belated yeah. happy birthday. Well, thank you. My goodness. Okay, so being here on the 80th anniversary of, of D-Day, um, what does that mean to you to go back and relive 80 years ago now? Well, you know, I always enjoy talking with the people who were involved in, at that time and also the people who continue to stay involved. Um, back here talking with people who came up to me, so many of them, they had parents and grandparents uh, who served uh, at that time and also uh, after that time. But uh, I'm just, I'm glad to keep in touch with those people. Uh, And and I was part of an honor honor guard about eight, uh, honor flight about uh, eight years ago, mm-hmm. and the thing that I enjoyed about that honor flight was just visiting with the people who were involved. And uh, But at that time, just very few of us, World War II veterans, were even able to make the flight. Yeah. Uh, it was mostly Korean. Mm-hmm. It was. Okay. Yeah. So um, you were obviously down uh, protecting the Panama Canal at the time. Were you in the... Were you drafted before D-Day, or was it after, technically, D-Day? It was after. It was after D-Day. It was after. Okay. Yeah. So you were you were part of World War II for the, what would you say, the final six to nine months or so, give or take? Yes. Okay. Yeah. What was the uh, mindset, I mean, as the war is wrapping up and it's looking better and better for the United States, what is the mindset, what's the feeling of, of just the military in general over those final few months? Well, uh I think that uh, I'm there in, in Panama, uh, we knew the war, the fighting was over, and uh, they were encouraging people to uh, enlist, and draftees to enlist in a regular army, you know. And uh, but if you did, you would have been a part of, um, like you'd you'd been subject to recall during the Korean War. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the people who did re-enlist, they did also, they served during the Korean War. And actually, I enlisted in the Air Force two weeks after the Korean War started. Really? Yes. I wanted I wanted to get into a different branch of service, and I, I spent four years in Strategic Air Command, two years with, with the 93rd Bomb Wing in California, and two years at SAC headquarters in Omaha. And, wow, uh, and uh, we we were involved mainly in, in the Cold War. I mean, with the uh, yeah, Cold War was the Soviet Union, and we had our bombers uh, all over, actually all over the 
around the surroundings of the Soviet Union, they were loaded with nukes. And uh, start when I went in 1950, they would have been doing those nukes with the, uh, or carrying those nukes with the uh, B-29s. By the time I got out, they were doing the old jet B-47s. Uh, and uh, they, uh, we had one, one wing over in um, uh, Morocco, Mm-hmm. They, and they flew B-40, B-47s out of there. Uh, That's amazing. Kenneth Johnson is here, uh, 97 years young. All you've got is a cane. You look great. You sound yeah. great. I mean, yeah. God bless you, and thank you for your service. Take us back to post-war 1945 America. What is this country like back then? Um, what is the post-war America like, the, the enthusiasm as you guys come home? heroes and uh, come home victors well one thing that i really am concerned about is the divide in this country between in in every way a cultural divide the political divide Uh, we need to start getting together again Uh, we if if all we're doing is just fighting one another over details it's it's a lost cause Mm -hmm. Uh, but we do need to learn to, basically, we need to learn to respect other people and other people's views, mm-hmm. you know, and then work it out together. Uh, that that wasn't an issue back then, was it? It wasn't. It wasn't. In fact, uh, when they were drafting people at that time, they drafted doctors, engineers, uh, lawyers, medical, you know, people. Uh, they were all subject to the draft, and they served uh, and as time went on, that did not happen. It was not happening. Uh, and uh, yeah. There's no draft. The draft is never coming back. But no. was it good for unifying America in some sense? It was in that everybody knew they were equal. They, they knew they were equal. They knew they were uh, both your, your top brass and your enlisted soldier. They knew that constitutionally they're equal they're not equal in rank but they're equal as human beings yeah if they knew that and when you think about bridging the divide in this country is there anything over your time serving your 97 plus years on this planet that we can do to fix it yes i think we can start uh recognizing the changes that have taken place in our you know, in our culture and in our economy and in our, the changes have taken place and we need to do some repair work. Yeah. We do. (laughs) Well, absolutely agree on that front, sir. (laughs) Kenneth Johnson, thank you for your service. Thank you for coming on the show here on KCMO in Kansas City. Are you from Kansas, by the way? I, well, I've lived in Kansas 25 years. I grew up in Kentucky, but I've lived uh, in, I spent Probably, I'd say, about 35 years in Quad Cities in Illinois as a teacher, a high school and community college teacher. Wow. And then what brought you to Kansas? My daughter, she's a professor at Kansas State University. So are you living in Manhattan then? I live next door to my daughter. I have a house next door to my daughter. In Manhattan? Yes. Wow. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, you're As far as anyone here is concerned, you're a Kansan, sir. Thank you for all you've done for this country, and thank you for joining us on KCMO Talk Radio. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Kenneth Johnson on KCMO. Yeah. Unreal.